your life, your security, the freedom and the security of this country is the ultimate objective. And this program has been described as indispensable, vital, mm -hmm. and critical. So all we want to do is go ahead and search already legally collected material. Uh, the, prob the real problem they have is they don't like 702. Mm -hmm. So rather than say that, they want to they wanna assert that you have constitutional rights if you are not living in the United States and you're not an American, and that's just not true. Certainly it is not. We should leave that um, as the last word and let you get back to your day. Thanks so much, Congressman Trey Gowdy. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Another prominent House Republican is calling it quits as California Congressman Daryl Issa announces he will retire at the end of his term. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live on Capitol Hill. So why is Congressman Issa retiring, Mike? Dana, good afternoon. Congressman Daryl Issa told Fox this afternoon he wants to go out on top. The Congressman is a former chairman of the House Oversight Committee. Issa won a close race in 2016, and the Cook Political Report considered his district a toss-up in 2018. We caught up with Congressman Issa a short time ago. I came to Congress for a four-year tour, and I stayed for now going on 18. Uh, the generic ballot in my district is good. A uh, Republican will replace me. Uh, I think the economy says everything about the policies that, uh, that my party and this president helped champion. And uh, so it's a good time to go out on top. However, with ISA retiring, the Cook Political Report says that his district now leans Democratic, meaning it could be a place where Democrats pick up the seat. Dana? All right. He's also the eighth chairman to step down. Of course, they are term limited in those chairmanships. And where are lawmakers on some of the pressing fiscal matters they're facing right now? Well, Dana, Republican sources tell Fox a continuing resolution of a few weeks is expected to keep the lights on and keep the government up and running beyond January 19th. Fox News has confirmed that some of the key players are expected to meet with Trump administration officials next hour in Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy's office. Uh, Senators John Cornyn and Dick Durbin and from the House, Kevin McCarthy and Steny Hoyer expected to talk government funding and immigration. Facing a January 19th deadline, lawmakers are still arguing over where to set the spending levels on a two-year budget package. If we don't lift the spending caps in short order, the sharp acts of sequestration will fall on the military side of the budget and on the domestic side of the budget. That's a scenario everyone wants to avoid. Many Republicans want to boost defense spending, rebuilding the military. Many Democrats want to boost domestic spending priorities as well. Mm -hmm. Dana? All right, Mike, thank you so much. Sure. Rating stores nationwide, why federal agents descended on more than 107-11 stores across the country this morning, plus more on a federal judge blocking the Trump administration from ending the DACA program. We'll hear from Jonah Goldberg on why he thinks the judge made a bad decision. Immigration agents expanding their investigation into 7-Eleven stores. The Associated Press reporting that ICE agents entered dozens of stores this morning, opening audits and questioning employees. Officials calling this the largest operation against an employer under the Trump administration. The audits could lead to criminal charges or fines over the store's hiring practices. So a federal judge has blocked the Trump administration from moving forward with its plan to end DACA in March. The ruling came on the same day that President Trump hosted a bipartisan group of lawmakers for negotiations on immigration reform that would include a DACA fix. If we do this properly, DACA, you're not so far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you want to take it that further step, I'll take the heat. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take all the heat you want to give me. And I'll take the heat off both the Democrats and the Republicans. My whole life has been heat. <laughs> I like heat in a certain way. Let's bring in Jonah Goldberg, senior editor at the National Review and a Fox News contributor. Jonah, that heat start came pretty quickly, and it came often from the right. Take a listen to what Vice President Pence told Martha today. Ann Coulter, uh, Tucker Carlson on, on our own network, were really uh, felt very betrayed by what the president said at that table yesterday, that, that he sort of gave away the farm on the issue. Well, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I think the president has been very clear. There's no deal on DACA without a wall. Without a physical wall. And not only, not only without a wall, Martha, but also without ending the visa lottery program and ending the kind of chain migration mm -hmm. that has resulted in people coming into this country that have done harm to Americans in recent months. 
Jonah, I'd love to get your take on this because you've covered immigration issues for a long time and seen how presidents, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, take a lot of heat when they try to deal with this issue. What's your take? Yeah, uh, first of all, it's great to finally be on here. Thank um, you. Uh, I, I think there are a bunch of different things going on. I do, I do want to just say, as a sort of just a poli sci nerd, that what the what the Ninth Circuit did was outrageous and lawless. Um, if it was constitutional or legal for President Obama to implement a unilateral executive order establishing DACA, it has to be constitutional and legal for another president to rescind it. Right. And uh, James Madison never, and the other founders never would have right. imagined that the institutions of our government wouldn't be jealous guardians of their own prerogatives and power. And what we've seen, is, this, is a, this is a symptom of a much larger problem yeah. of institutions exceeding all of it. Okay, that yeah. out, out of the way. Um, I think President Trump, the meeting yesterday was optically kind of brilliant. It was smart. It, it quashed a lot of silly talk about the 25th Amendment. Yeah. B but in the process, he also undermined the Republican negotiating position about requiring either a wall or e-verify or other security measures along with any deal on DACA. He made it harder for Republicans to show a unified front, and that's why I think we're getting all this cleanup stuff today from Pence and others. And then I read this morning Dana Milbank in the Washington Post talked about how the Dreamers themselves are actually making it harder for them uh, on the left to get a deal because they are demanding too much as well from Pelosi and Schumer. No, I, I think that's right. I mean, one of the, the all of the attention and the thumb sucking uh, stuff from Washington over the last 10 years has all been about how the right has moved too far to the right on immigration. And I think if you're talking about places like Breitbart, um, you can make that case. Um, but what always gets left out is that the Democrats have moved so far to the left on immigration that it's it's really it's it, it's it's a two per, it's a two party problem in a lot of ways in terms of finding common ground. And remember in 2008, Hillary Clinton was taking the position that we shouldn't be giving illegal driver's, li driver's licenses to illegal immigrants, mm -hmm. and she got beaten up for it. Now, yeah. the idea that there should be any penalty for being an illegal immigrant is just simply verboten in the Democratic Party. All right, well, it's gonna be interesting to watch. Uh, just a yes or no, do you think they get a comprehensive deal done? Uh, comprehensive has, is a loaded term. I would say they get a deal done. <laughs> All right. Well, you're very good. And good luck uh, with that great new podcast of yours, The Remnant. Jonah oh, Goldberg. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. <laughs> School children in America suffering in cold classrooms. There was a room that was 37 degrees, and students were expected to stay in class all day. You can't learn in those conditions, and it needs to change. Angry parents and teachers demanding a solution. Will anything change? Plus, what one member of Congress wants her fellow lawmakers to do at the President's State of the Union address. Here's President Trump meeting with the Norwegian Prime Minister, Erna Solberg, in the Oval Office. Let's listen in. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to have Prime Minister Solberg of Norway. Uh, just had a very resounding election victory. So it's another four years at least. And uh, very respected by her country, very liked by her country. We do a lot of business with Norway, and I know you just bought some additional military equipment in the form of F-35s and other things. Mm -hmm. And so I congratulate you. We make the best in the world we make. and. Uh, Norway is a great customer and a great ally and a great friend. So it's an honor to have you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to say we are really appreciating the good work that we have together with the United States, that uh, you are our closest ally inside NATO. And uh, uh, we see your military personnel also training in Norway, and um, it's part of uh, what we think is very good on our bilateral uh, cooperation also. And in the last years, there's even been a surplus from, from the U.S. to Norway in an eco economic side, so we must be making good products. Well, we're doing a little bit, and <laughs> we, uh, we do make great products. And it was just, uh, we were just discussing with the Prime Minister, we make the greatest military equipment in the world, and you buy a lot of it, and we appreciate that. Mm. It's called jobs. But School it's jobs, also called yes. great equipment. Great you know, Norway, Norway contributes to, I think we have estimated it, supports up to 470,000 jobs in, uh, in the United States Correct. by, by our investment and what we are doing. So 
And, and it's a special thing, you know, we have very, our climate policy is now about making more, uh, our transportation system different. Yes. So no Teslas are a bit of a hit in Norway. Oh, good. Yes. Well, that's good. Electrical cars. We do that too. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's bring in Juan Williams. He's a Fox News political analyst and a co-host on The Five. Quick thoughts about that meeting there with the prime minister. They're going to have a press conference in an hour. Well, you know what I struck me was it almost seemed like a businessman's meeting congratulating each other on the deals and the money involved and the jobs involved. Uh, clearly, that was the emphasis. The unsaid part of it was NATO and clearly uh, Norway. Prime Minister Solberg very much warning the United States to be a staunch ally in terms of resisting uh, Russian incursions in, in the region. Yeah, absolutely. They're, yeah. they're absolutely worried about that. And so they've come to the right place, the White House. Yeah. Uh, Juan, the age, nation's aging infrastructure is causing problems for students. A high school in Fall River, Massachusetts, forced to close today after an aging water main break sent thousands of gallons into classrooms. In Baltimore, schools without heat and sub-freezing weather closed for days, sparking widespread anger at a school meeting. Watch this. We ask that you just allow us to speak, and then you can have your commentary, you can do your shout outs, but at least allow us the opportunity to communicate. Stop it! All these excuses. It's a tragedy. I can't even really go to work like I want to because I've got to take care of my children first. I should have to make that decision. Uh, Juan, you can understand those pa the parents' frustration uh, for their children, but also are just Baltimore schools just starved of resources? They are. And here's the thing. that First of all, of course, cold weather around the country, and you see it in other places other than Baltimore, as you just described, Dana. Mm -hmm. But what you see in a situation like Baltimore is just heartbreaking that kids can't be in a classroom where they are warm, and I would add safe, but warm, first and foremost, and get an education. So you're asking the kids to come into a cold classroom, uh, and oftentimes if there are that kind of conditions, it also means there's no hot food mm -hmm. for lunch or any or breakfast mm -hmm. programs. So the kids come there and it's like, well, this is school, but I'm being punished. Mm -hmm. And the people in charge are failing the children, which is, to me, unacceptable. So how do you, how do we how do they get accountability then? Well, now this is quite interesting because if you look at this situation, overwhelmingly the people who are doing this are people who are in the janitorial union or whatever. They're part of that larger union structure mm -hmm. and they're supposed to, and oftentimes it, it really gets crazy in New York City, like they're responsible for opening and closing the school. Well, you would think, wait a second, who decides if a school should be open or closed? It should be the administrators and the principal, right. but oftentimes the janitor. And if the janitor is failing, then it's up to somebody to say, listen, you're a problem. But of course, with the union, sometimes that's not what happens. It's like, you know, this is our authority. This is our province. We'll do what we can. Don't bother us. Well, so uh, you know, under a Trump administration, obviously there's a, a push for local decisions. But is this a situation where if a school system is not able to even open on days to have school for these kids, should the federal government consider doing something to help? I, I'm very reluctant to say that the federal government should get involved there, but I do think this. When you have a crisis situation where children are not being educated, where they're not given the opportunity, in my mind, to really get their foot mm -hmm. in position to start climbing that ladder of upward mobility, the American dream, then you do have a crisis. And I'm surprised that sometimes the governor, and I've seen governors take over local school right. systems. Like in, like in Michigan. And in, in Maryland Detroit. at times, mm -hmm. there have been talk about the Baltimore school system right. in specific. And you would hope that the people at the U.S. Department of Education, uh, Betsy DeVos and others, would be aware that this yeah. is going on and say, we must help. Do something. All right, Juan Williams, I'll see you in a couple of hours on Thank the five. Thanks My for pleasure. being here. Uh, Republicans are encouraging popular, uh, a popular author to run for the Senate in Ohio. We're going to tell you who that is. Plus, the Trump administration is doing an about face on offshore drilling, at least in one state. What prompted it and whether other states could follow suit? A court decision sparking political chaos in North Carolina. A panel of federal judges ordering the state to redraw its congressional voting maps, finding them unconstitutional because they were designed to give Republicans an advantage. Garrett Tenney is live in Washington. Garrett. 
Well, Dana, this ruling is raising a lot of eyebrows here in Washington as well, because if it's upheld, it could put several more House Republican seats in danger in this in this coming midterm elections. Late yesterday, a panel of three federal judges ruled that Republicans in North Carolina's General Assembly violated the Constitution in 2016 by redrawing the state's congressional districts to ensure Republican domination. In the nearly 200 page opinion, Judge William Austin Jr. writes that state lawmakers have shown both an intent to subordinate the interest of non-Republican voters and entrench Republican candidates in power, all with the effect of controlling electoral outcomes to continue a 10 to 3 Republican control of congressional seats. The court has given the state's General Assembly until January 24th to come up with a new redistricting plan, but Republicans are vowing to appeal the decision to the Supreme Court. The high court is already facing two other challenges on gerrymandering, dealing with state legislator voting maps in Wisconsin and Maryland, but this case is the first time a federal court has blocked a congressional map because of partisan favoritism. What makes this case so interesting is that in 2016, Republicans openly stated the new map was drawn to their advantage. That's a practice that both parties have been doing it in one form or another for generations. So this ruling also has the potential to set a legal precedent for that being done in other states as well. Adding to all of this is if state lawmakers don't come up with a new redistricting plan in the next few weeks, the court said it will redraw the map itself. That is sure to face legal challenges. Well, state Republicans argue redistricting is a legislative duty in North Carolina and that it's not up to the court to decide how lawmakers should go about doing it. Dana? Really interesting. All right, Garrett, thanks so much. For it. more on this, David Bossie is the chairman of Citizens United and co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Let Trump Be Trump. David, you're a good guest to have on today. You know the Supreme Court pretty well. You follow it. Um, <laughs> yes. What do you think could happen here in this case uh, in North Carolina? Because it's not the only one that is up for possible review by the Supreme Court. It, it is. It could be the third one, uh, as he was just talking about. Wisconsin and Maryland both have cases that have been accepted by the uh, Supreme Court to be held, I believe, the oral arguments for this spring. Uh, this particular case seems to be a little bit more political. A, a little bit of a partisan judge here seems to be saying he doesn't like the partisan nature of the lines that have been drawn. So I think one solution is that the Supreme Court could stay. Uh, this ruling and hold it in abeyance until these other cases are dealt with. And I think that that's a distinct possibility here. Uh, the other one is that they could just redraw uh, the lines by the deadline in a couple of weeks. And that's a very tall order. Indeed. And I, I guess if the Supreme Court stays it and waits for these other cases, then this is not a factor in the 2018 midterms. Correct. We actually wouldn't know anything until 2020. That's right. You'd have the current lines stay exactly as they are hmm. through this November, and then they would have to deal with it uh, once the Supreme Court rules in these other cases. And they could also accept this case as a third uh, redistricting mm -hmm. case that the Supreme Court could hear mm -hmm. as well. Let me ask you about Ohio, because that is one place where uh, well, President Trump won handily, and of course you remember that, but there <laughs> is an open Senate seat right now. Um, and last week, one of the Republicans that was going to, to run. He's decided he's not going to be able to do that. He's citing his wife's health problems. And J.D. Vance, who is the author of Hillbilly Elegy, has been called by Mitch McConnell. And here's what his spokesperson said, that the phone hasn't stopped ringing since Friday. The amount of support for J.D. Vance is incredible. People are starting to realize he has the best message to beat Democratic incumbent Sher Sherrod Brown. J.D. is giving serious consideration toward this because there are very serious people asking him to run. He does have a very compelling story. I think he's an incredibly accomplished person, but that doesn't always turn, make you a really good candidate. What do you yeah, think of this? Yeah, Dan Dana, you're exactly right. Look, this is a very short window we have to deal with. The, 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 the primary election is gonna be upon us. The filing deadline is, is within weeks. And mm -hmm. so I think that they need to look at somebody who's a little bit more well-established and has some name ID. I, I, I personally think that Jim Renacci, who is currently in the, in the uh, House of Representatives, been a member of Congress and a tremendous member of Congress, who is currently running for governor, uh, I think that he should look at, at changing races and run for the United States Senate now that Josh Mandel has mm -hmm. dropped out. 
and maybe J.D. Vanson could run for his congressional seat and <laughs> we could just move well, them you all around what? there, the pieces JD, on the chessboard. Mr. Vance seems like he's a tremendous uh, person with a tremendous story, Indeed. but I think that this is a very short window for somebody who's uh, literally an unknown uh, having to get into this very expensive, very big race. But it's certainly not impossible, so we'll keep an it, eye on that. Never say, never say never. Well, I have you. Could I ask you just one about one other place, and that is Utah. We uh, Apparently, there is great support for Mitt Romney to run in Utah by his wife, Anne. Uh, Ann Romney told Mitt in 1993, you can gripe and gripe all you want about how upset you are about the direction the country's going, but if you don't stand up and do something about it, then you know, shut up and stop bothering me. Uh, <laughs> this is reported in the Boston Globe that she's very much encouraging her husband to run in Utah. Do you think that's going to happen? Well, I think so. I, I was surprised recently to read about his health scare. I will say that he's going to have to put the, you know, his health out there and make sure that people understand that he could serve six years yes, and is healthy to, to do that. For people that might not know, um, it was reported, I think it was on Monday or maybe Friday of last week, that uh, Mitt Romney was treated for prostate cancer last summer. And, 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 and that's exactly right. And, and I hope he is incredibly well. And I think that that is something, it's a six-year term, it's a long time, and he's not uh, a spring chicken. He's not an old man, but he's, he will be one of the older U.S. senators to get elected as the first time. Right, 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 right. Um, because there's certainly other, other members of Congress who are uh, much old, up much there, older, especially on much the Democratic older. side. <laughs> that's, that's right. But then that's again, right. We're getting up there too, David. You and me. Oh, hey, never. No, 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 no. We, <laughs> it's we're good to have younger. you on the show today. We're Thanks younger. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> the Trump administration making a major change to its offshore drilling plan, announcing that the state of Florida is now off the table. Bill Keating is reporting live from Miami. Phil, that was a quick turnaround. Quick turnaround, Dana, leading several other governors around the country today to wonder. How can they be a lot like Florida? Less than a week after President Trump's executive order announcing his decision to greatly expand offshore drilling for oil and gas all around the country, which affects every single coastal state, Florida suddenly becomes the first state exempted. In the past week, many Florida Republican lawmakers in a rarity bucked the president, joining Florida Democrats and environmentalists opposing expansion of federal waters, including Senator Marco Rubio and Gulf Coast Congressman Francis Rooney. We are highly developed residential uh, coastline. A lot of uh, tourist uh, industry is our main industry, and we can't suffer the risks of another, another BP horizon. Governor Rick Scott asked for a meeting with the Interior Secretary, and last night at the airport, he got it in Tallahassee. Results took just about 20 minutes. And so for Floridians, uh, we are not drilling off the coast of Florida. And it did not take long at all for other governors to quickly chime in last night as well as today. New York's Governor Cuomo saying, how can New York get a waiver? And today, Governor Chris Christie from New Jersey uh, also pleading with the Interior Department for the exact same exemption Florida got. Probably doesn't yeah. hurt for a Republican governor to ask for this, especially if they're thinking of running for the Senate uh, right. next year. But this isn't the first time that Republican governors in Florida have had to fight this battle, is it? Uh, not at all. Uh, previous Republican governors of the state of Florida, including Governor Chris, uh, Governor Christ, Charlie Crist, as well as Governor Jeb Bush, both pretty much uh, for their careers worked hard to keep oil rigs off the Florida coastline, 1,300 miles of coastline. In fact, in 1992, state lawmakers banned oil drilling for oil as well as gas off in state waters. In 2001, President Bush outlined his proposed energy plan, which a lot like Trump's immediate led to a, a lot of bipartisan criticism around the country, with critics accusing Bush and Cheney of behind the door secrecy, demanding price controls, price caps, and no new rigs. Now, regarding Interior Secretary Zinke's decision last night to take Florida off the drilling table, while well, one person in particular in the state of Florida sees this as nothing but pure politics, and that is Democratic Senator Bill Nelson, who has long championed a permanent ban off of Florida's coastline of any rigs, period. He says the president is simply doing this because he wants Governor Scott to run against him, Senator mm -hmm. Nelson, this November, which would be a highly loaded with all kinds of national money campaign for the U.S. Senate. Well, never Dana. a dull moment in Florida. Thanks so much. <laughs> never. <laughs>
President Trump pushing for bipartisanship in 2018, but how do you get people to work together in this kind of political climate? I'll ask two former White House insiders about that. Plus, California mudslides taking the lives of at least 15 people and others.